Hello and welcome to All Aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. This is a podcast about accessibility and sustainable public transport, brought to you by Transport Infrastructure Ireland. I'm Claire Scott and I'm joined by our All Aboard podcast host, Sarah O'Donnell. Throughout the series, we'll be hearing first-hand accounts from people who use and design public transport systems, and specifically the role accessibility plays in these experiences. And who is this podcast for? In the first instance, we hope to connect with people with disabilities who use our services. But also, it's for anyone who is drawn to human interest stories and has a curiosity to learn more. And of course, we hope to attract listeners who are designers and decision makers for transport systems, who through the podcast might get a better understanding of some of the problems and potential solutions that are out there. So without further ado, let's give this a go and get all aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. Hi Sarah, what's the theme of this episode? Hi Claire, so the title of this episode is La Cita dei Bambini, which translates from Italian as the City of Children. La Cita dei Bambini is part of a UNICEF programme which argues that a city designed for children is a city for everyone. In many ways, it's similar in concept to universal design. So we begin the programme by talking to Angie Morley. Although Angie is now a young woman and no longer una bambina, she tells us about her experiences as a child growing up with cerebral palsy and of her life as a student. And then later in the programme, we chat to the esteemed Dr Lorraine Darcy from TU Dublin about walking, placemaking and creating inclusive streets and spaces for children and for everyone. Enjoy. So we're joined by Reddy and Angie Morley. You're very welcome to All Aboard, TII's Accessibility Podcast. Reddy, you're TII's safety I am, officer. I said I'm Head of Safety, Occupation and Railway Safety. So I would know you very well. We've worked together for a long time. But um, I think maybe we we'll start with Angie. You're very welcome, Angie. Thank you. Uh, you're uh, Reddy's daughter. And so you're here just to uh, chat about yourself, your uh, disability, your wonderful ability by the sounds of things. Um, just from chatting to you and from chatting to Reddy, I can already hear about all the fantastic things <laughs> you're involved in. So maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself to start. So my name is Angie. I'm 20 years old and recently I like I have done a degree in Irish and Sociology in Maynooth and my disability is cerebral palsy. Very good. And you're in third year in Maynooth? Yeah, I just finished my final year there two weeks ago. With the exams two weeks ago anyway. I hope hope all went well there. Yeah, <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And that's your end of year exams. Yeah. So um, just for people who don't know, tell us a little bit about cerebral palsy and how that um, impacts on your life. So cerebral palsy is quite a wide spectrum. Like you can line up five different people and you wouldn't think they had the same condition, but it affects me and like my legs and my arms. So my tone in my legs and my arms is quite high and my bones grow quicker than my muscles. So my muscles have to catch up with them to an extent. That's probably the easiest way I can explain it. Sure. And so, I mean, uh, when you came in this morning, you used a walker. Yeah. Uh, and does that is that your usual way of, of traveling around? or or? Yeah, so I've always used a walker. It's always kind of been something like come with if you want. But yeah. I use a manual chair sometimes for places that you wouldn't get a power chair into. But recently, after my leaving cert, I got a power chair for college because I went to Manute University, which is... Very accessible, but two very huge campuses. They're split into two, so you have the north and the south. But the distance between buildings, you wouldn't get, well, me personally, I wouldn't get around in the walk. I wouldn't have the energy levels to walk from, let's say, the canteen to the main building because it's quite a bit of a stretch. So the power chair in that regard is very easy to get around. Get and, of course, moving from lecture to lecture, and there's an awful lot of travelling between. But it's good to hear that Maynooth University is is kind of geared up for that. And that yeah, you, yeah, definitely. Like, and my lecturers work very good in putting my tutorials in a place where I could get to. Like, there was one, I think one morning they had to move it, and I had to go to another um, tutorial because I couldn't get into it because it was an old building, but they had no problem in, like, 
So I think not so it was yeah. it's very easy. As a access student it's quite easy to get revenue. Like there's no pressure. That's really good and good that even at short notice that your lecturers can kind of uh, you know make make the changes that are needed. And is there a good um kind of collegiate atmosphere out in Maynooth? Are you you enjoyed the three years that you were there? Definitely, yeah. Like the minute I walked in I seen in from different years a few girls in power chairs and few different disabilities but what's great about Minute is we have what's called like Minute Access Programme Ambassadors yeah so we have our own orientation program for students with disabilities from the HEAR scheme PLCs matures like all that type anyone that didn't come through like direct leaving to route we have our own orientation and you get to meet different students with different disabilities so you're welcome with open arms which is yeah great. that's fantastic and like you say loads of kind of Diverse interactions and that, that you know, it's definitely, just, yeah, yeah it's, uh, brilliant. It sounds very social and, and really good. And um, in terms of getting to and from Maynooth, are you, do, would you travel by train or bus or, or? So the first kind of interaction I had with, we have a disability, well, I had a disability advisor and the first thing they said was they would organise um, transport for me. So I got a taxi in first year until the lockdown yeah, and right. then they re kind of distributed the service out. And then I ended up having a few different taxi people, taxi member. I had um, a really good, um, consistent one. So it was all funded by... The university and it was great for independence as well. Excellent. So ready, um, proud dad. Absolutely. <laughs> so I remember when we were out on site one time, you telling me about Angie, and it was clear that you were very proud of her. Uh, and uh, so is is Angie your uh, only only daughter? Only yes. daughter, yes, yeah. Yes. So uh, just growing when Angie was small and uh, in the early days, did uh, did you and Mary require, was there a lot of adjustment needed at home? Did you adapt the house or was there accommodation needed? Or but Not really, no. Yeah. no it, it, it is, um, that we're sort of lucky to have a sort of a, a, a nice wide or a nice, a nice spacious house. Yeah. So, so uh, there was one or two steps uh, that we had to modify, but uh, that, that, that there was nowhere where a walker couldn't get around. Yeah. And um, yeah, as, uh, and, and she came home uh, uh, that she spent... Um, Spent quite a considerable amount of time in in in, uh, in hospital after she was born, and and, and is when she came home. It was just it, it was just a pleasure from, from, from that day one to, to now, and and it hasn't really been difficult or anything like that. You're just yeah, 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 but a, yeah, a joy from day one, Angie. <laughs> it's always nice to hear. Uh, and I remember the day we were chatting. You mentioned about um, about the film that Angie was in. So Angie, tell us about that. It, it was, sounds fantastic and. Uh, Making the grade, is it? I did piano for the guts of, I want to say, 10 years. I'm not particularly, like, 10, yeah, definitely 10. And I had a great um, piano teacher, Amanda Hurkin, who I've had, like, from the first ever piano lesson I did. I had her straight up, and we've always had, like, a really good bond from then on. And since I've stopped the piano, the bond is still there and still friendship, which is great. And one day, the principal of the piano school, um, he was looking for, I think, two partnerships to put in and he asked to put me in Amanda Ford and obviously mum and dad said yes to that, which was really fun. And we started to, we had to do an interview at home mm -hmm. and then I kind of, it was all about learning piano and how different kids at different ages, like in the grades and the exam system kind of learn piano. And we had to do, um, kind of film a lesson of yeah. how we'd normally do it. And at the time I stopped doing exams because after I think it's grade two you have to use the pedal and my kind of legs wouldn't have the strength to use the pedal mm -hmm. and play at the same time it's just the way my cerebral party kind of works yeah and like we had I think stay with me Sam Smith was one of the songs we play I played I don't know the other two I keep trying to remember them You've but blocked I, just, it out. <laughs> I just can't remember yeah and I had started like um freestyle and like rapping over piano chords at the time now very very badly yeah. <laughs> I will give myself that and I just was constantly doing it with Amanda every week I'd come in with something new and she still says it to this day because I don't know how you how you did that and how you still do it and we had played all the songs in the 
cameraman Ken and Steve, they were lovely. Like it was very relaxed and yeah. we had done everything that we needed to do and the cameras were off and I turned to Amanda and like, right, what do we do now? Because we have everything done. Mm-hmm. And she's like, you can rap, like do it. And I was like, okay, I had absolutely nothing prepared. Go off the top of my head. Not <laughs> not my best work at all. Some people may disagree with that, mm-hmm. but like it wasn't but completely ad lib when you just yeah. took off and, and had, they, no. they were they fil- did you know that they were filming or yeah yeah, yeah good. Amanda says to me to this day like you were lo- like she was looking around the two lads' jaws were dropped. Wow. And I obviously didn't see that and I wasn't sure like what they'd put into the film or whatever. Yeah. And they put that in. I'm like, Oh, okay. I was only recently showing my one of my college best friends, she was up for a weekend. Yeah, I was only showing her there a few weeks ago, and obviously, mom and dad have brought it up to her. <laughs> and I usually don't because it's it is something I'm proud of, but my ability now has gone a lot up since. And she was like, Wow, like this is so good. I'm like, You haven't, that's only the start of it. Like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's phenomenal. And Reddy, you were saying that the first time you saw that was when you actually went to the screening of um, Making the Grade. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that you had that hadn't realised that he, 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 he was sitting in the cinema and, and I was sitting beside her and it was, uh, it was very proud to see your daughter up on the big screen but when she started rapping I, I just couldn't believe it I just yeah. I was so proud it's, it's not something like, like, like there's I even write more songs and I think I've only showed you one so far so you were saying that you're going to you're doing a music course this yeah. year you finished your degree and you're going to start a master's uh, the year after next yeah and so ne- uh, this year you're going to be uh, signed up to a, a music course which is amazing and yeah yeah so like as you were saying the kind of progression from age 14 with your music you've been working on it very hard and like definitely it's developing yeah it was something when I was younger I never really had like I think only I think within the lockdown I kind of gained more confidence because I never really had confidence in myself like I'd always be that person that would put up a video on Instagram and then delete it an hour later because I didn't like it and yeah. do the same and the same and the same again. But I then, I think in March, I did like an Instagram competition. Just it was over the same beat and everyone just did the same thing. And I met a lot of great people from that yeah. and wider people from the music scene in Dublin who like gave me a lot of confidence. And then I just wanted to start production. I'm one of them people that... And especially in music, like I want to do yep. everything in anthem. Like yeah. it's in you. Like if I think if you feel that uh, compulsion to do it, yeah. it's because you have the talent. It's because you you know you, you need to do it almost. Yeah. And so the course would be great from that point of view, and that you'll have musicians of all definitely yeah. backgrounds and and abilities and kind of um, instruments or whatever. That's yeah, really because fantastic. BIM is a music college in itself, so you can do diplomas, degrees and masters in mm-hmm. either production, music business, music marketing, and then you have piano, drums, bass, guitar and vocals, I think. I know a few people who did vocals and guitars as the degree. Yeah. Brilliant. And what are you thinking of doing the masters in or have you have you decided yet? Well my original I was thinking of primary school teaching, which I still Brilliant. Am. <laughs> yeah. That's still a goal, but because of um the maths requirement I got and apply this year. Yeah. So I'm going to have to obviously take the year out and then do the maths and then apply for January 2023. Yeah, yeah. that's the right year. And you'd be all the better a teacher having yeah. done all the music and everything like that. You know, yeah. it'll, be, it'll be really good. I'd say you'd make a brilliant teacher. Gosh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, gosh. Yeah, it's really, it's, um, it was the rapping that really took me by really surprise because our house would have been a, a very 1970s music based house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Nothing and, wrong with 1970s no, music? No, no, no. Like, so yeah. it was, when I heard her rapping, I, I, was, I, was, I was amazed because yeah. I did because... Uh, yeah. Not really a, something you'd expect or a, or a Mead thing anyway. You're living in Mead and everything. So I know that the buses and the train services have have improved drastically and I know from even um kind of meetings that I attend that they've they've they're trying their best with the train to reduce the uh, advanced booking down to four hours and all of that but it's still uh it's still not the easiest is it no I've never um actually tried like I've had a few experiences obviously on public transport and stuff but it's more difficult like you have to plan ahead as you said for like a few hours in advance you yeah. can you can't really like so well you could but it would be a bit 
I'd say stressful to do so. Yeah. And like, it's more easier to get in the car with a power chair and just drive. But I have um, two friends, Tracy and Yvonne, and Tracy has a, an assistance dog, the same as myself, and they train everywhere. Like, train both Lewis, like, yeah. and David and Tracy is in the power chair as well. So okay. they've been trying to convince me for the last two years, if even more, to try it. Try it, Try yeah. the train with them. So in a few weeks, I think I'm going to try that but yeah. just to see how it actually works and yeah and I mean I suppose it'd be it's, it's it's really good that you have friends who who kind of feel confident you know using those services as well so that that's really good that it's kind of you know it'll be when you're going out with them it'll be kind of a day yeah. fun, fun day anyway and but also that you'll have the confidence that they are used to the system as well so definitely it's really yeah. good and you have an assistance dog yeah so what, i got my story? assistance dog fax in 20 2014 2013 so he helps me with walking on my stability so if you're going into like a big crowd it's easier to, to bring him into a big crowd than a wheelchair of any kind or a walker because people kind of step so he's trained to kind of just clear a path maybe and yes. just make a bit of space around you and you know yeah so he's from dogs for the disabled down in cork so we were on the list for, I'd say, about three or so years, if I could be wrong on that. But we were, and we went down for to obviously be matched with him and for the training week. So the minute we got down there, we were going to shopping centres and practising with one of the trainers, Jenny Dowler. She's a really, really good trainer. So we were going to shopping centres, dog parks, um, going through supermarkets, loads of places like we were there for I think Monday to Friday but every day we were doing something yeah we weren't yeah it was just practice 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 constantly and now it just comes and was the dog a a pup at that stage so Fax was too when we got him so he they go to socializers for about 18 months so we had a lovely socializer over in Drada which we've only realized afterwards but they go to them for 18 months and they bring them out into different situations and environments and then Fax went to show them in Wicklow for I don't know how long that was but and then he came back to the headquarters in Cork and then Jenny trained him up and matched him with me and that's and you've kind of more or less grown up together <laughs> you know, like yeah, you think yeah. that's yeah and is he a Labrador? Yeah, he's a Labrador. There's a picture of me on this year's calendar and I was like 12. <laughs> like I've changed a lot since yeah, then. Yeah, God. And you, you were saying that you go horse riding as yeah, well. Yeah, so I did horse riding when I was younger. I don't know when I stopped it, but I did it for a good while. I was, like, I was really fun. It was really good for like balance and everything like that. I went to Bachelor's Lodge first when I was younger and they would usually have leaders and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I went to Maria Dunn over in Carlinstown mm-hmm. and stuff. I, mean, I had a leader the first day and the first day she's like, no, nope, like you're not having leaders. So it gave you confidence and you had to keep yourself upright and yeah. stuff like that. So it was. I'm always amazed. I mean, I've only been horse riding once or twice myself and I'm nervous wreck but I'm always amazed at <laughs> yeah. how uh, they kind of just leave you off and you know, <laughs> like I would be quite they're, nervous they're all very con- confident themselves they you know but, um, I would be quite nervous now my best friend is very is um, and her whole family are horses and like are into horses and they have all their own horses and they go racing and everything and she has to be trying to convince me to get back up on one and I'm like no you're okay <laughs> yeah and with the horse riding that you did was did the uh, school have to have a particular training to no nope. no nope. so they just really. get on the horse and and I think it was the two o'clock lesson yeah I yeah. was in and anyone who was signed up for the two o'clock lesson just went, went in and first, yeah. he did like trotted around the feet trotted around the indoor arena and then they had an outdoor yeah arena and like the teacher Maria would be standing in the middle and she'd be telling you like what to do yeah so there was no like real um exceptions, exceptions made or, no yeah. I don't remember any exceptions been made anyway yeah and it's brilliant to have that have that skill you know like it's great to be able to come back to whenever you want to you know yeah yeah that's fantastic so um Angie so you're going to go out with your pals and maybe uh uh navigate the trains and the hopefully the Lewis as well yeah I've yeah. been on the Lewis <laughs> once or twice I was in the board gosh theater there 
to Thailand this year with the, my same two friends, mm -hmm. and we had went we went to, as far as one of the lowest stops to get to Connolly, I think it was. Yeah, and it was like my friend Yvonne, she's brilliant. She had me and Tracy both in our pair of chairs, and she was just helping us to get on. So it was quite easy to do. Yeah, particularly if it's not crowded, I think that's a, the big thing, isn't it? That you're the inside was a, was busy, but like the queue of people getting on wasn't so bad. So it was quite like less, not much stress and stress involved to actually get on. So which is good to know. Yeah. Um, and in terms of going to kind of concerts and and gigs and everything like that, yeah, you, I'm if, never you, if you're into yeah, <laughs> if you're into I'm the music, eligible. you're going to be yeah, yeah yeah. I have about like six or seven this month. <laughs> which is mental, but... That's brilliant. Yeah, the Three Arena was actually one of the first gigs I went to, and they're brilliant. Like, you get in, you, like, you don't have to go into any of the queues. Yeah. They bring you straight in. Like, someone brings you up to the lift, someone meets you to bring out to your seat in the same back, and I've been to some of, like, the smaller, like, smaller venues. Like, I was in the Workman's Club Cellar there yeah. last Saturday, and... Obviously, there was like a few steps and everything, but everyone was there just to help. Yeah, which was great. Like, there's never we've never had an issue where it's like Sorry, you've had to turn away or whatever. No. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And hopefully, you yourself will be on one of those stages. <laughs> that's <laughs> the plan. Anyway. Yeah, that's uh, like I'm going to be looking out for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. And so, Angie, just uh, I suppose you demonstrated like what a fantastic full life. Uh, you have and really delighted to be chatting to you today thank you ready thank you very much oh that's great it's been a great pleasure yeah an yeah, absolute pleasure so we're really pleased to welcome today dr lorraine darcy welcome lorraine we're really pleased to have you um, and there's going to be plenty to talk about uh, lorraine you are sustainable Sustainability Action Research and Innovation Lead at Technical University Dublin, TU Dublin. And you've previously were a senior lecturer in the School of Transport and Engineering and also co-chair of a master's in transport and mobility. So, you know, yeah. uh, plenty going on. But maybe if you explain to us in your own words just about yourself and your background and... Uh, yeah. No, I am. Um, I often describe myself as someone who has a bit of a portfolio career. So I am a civil engineer and transport planner. And um, some people are surprised to know that I have a, a, a research master's in asphalt technology as well. <laughs> but, um, um, but I I worked in transportation planning, but I, I, I concurrently was working in children's sport. Um, and a, as a result of that, I ended up working in the Irish Sports Council and kind of becoming more aware of the determinants of physical activity, physical activity and health uh, and that side of the house. Um, and so ended up doing a PhD in exercise and environmental psychology, mm -hmm. which essentially going, what are the determinants of individuals behavior, particularly around physical activity, but in general? And how does the environment around them influence those decisions? Mm -hmm. And so I looked at it through the lens of walking and walkability. And um, from there, yeah, I've worked in health policy. I've worked in um, lots of different, um, you know, facets of the transportation industry, um, as well as the health and well-being side of things. And then culminated into a lecturing position where, you know, which led to us developing the MSc in Sustainable Transport Mobility, which has a person focus and, you know, taking an outward view of how do we holistically provide good transport systems, um, you know, with the person at the centre. Yeah. And so that's, you know, and it's the first... Um, it's the first course accredited for its transport planning professional chartership in Ireland. So it's it's a bit different to what has been there previously. Yeah, yeah. move away from just kind of a narrow engineering um, viewpoint or, uh, you know, Absolutely, or yeah. narrow behavioural science. It's merging everything. It's environmental, everything. Yeah. And just on walkability, I mean, probably when you, you know, initially maybe people think, that that's so niche or whatever, but it must, it, it opened up a whole new world of, you know, how, how, Everything really in society is connected to how people get around. Yeah. So there was kind of two key quotes that were my takeaways from my research. And one was walkability means different things to different people, but also different things to the same person in different contexts. So like, you know, an able-bodied person walking solo through the city, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't mind cobbles, doesn't mind narrow streets, you know, is probably more interested in the ambience of the space. 
But if that same person is suddenly pushing a buggy or has someone with reduced mobility, um, all of a sudden their needs are very different in that time and space. Yeah. So, um, you know, walkability is very contextual. Mm-hmm. So we can, you know, so the ultimate in relation to walk or designing for walkability is a universal design approach. But interestingly, when people talk about the importance of atmosphere and to what we call the genius loci, which is like the sense of place, they sh- People then tend to kind of pick locations like let's take one from in Dublin, uh, Camden Street, which from a functional walkability perspective, the footpaths are narrow and, you know, there's you know traffic there. But it has this sense of community and environment that yeah. people love. So in an ideal scenario, we want to capture both of those. We want a good functional space, but also that lovely atmosphere, atmosphere and community. Exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's so interesting. And just in terms of walking and Children in particular, I mean, it's huge. Everybody can see with their own eyes. It's been a massive reduction of kids playing on the street, traveling independently to school, etc. Um, and that's kind of a, I mean, it's car dominance in planning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, we often call children the indicator species Yeah, <laughs> that if you do see children, particularly um, children moving independently in a space, that you know that that's a safe and successful place. So when we're designed for walking, comfort and safety are the two main determinants of whether someone is going to walk, um, you know, and there's obviously the functional needs as well. But like, you know that when um, if you're designing for children, um, you need to feel comfortable and that if you feel like you can let their hand go, mm-hmm. that is that is the key indicator here. And, you know, it's designed for throughout the life course. So we have to think about like, you know, whether it's when, when we're pushing that buggy, when, you know, that toddler. And I think actually for me as a mum, it was the... It, I, 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 we lived on a junction, a really <laughs> a, a bad junction with no um, pedestrian crossings on it. When I was pushing the buggy, I felt... I felt relatively okay because I could, you know, kind of judge the traffic and whatever. But it was when I was then teaching my children to cross the road. Yeah. And we lived right across the road from a shop. Like they should have been able to cross the road to the shop. Yeah. And all of a sudden having that realization going, there is no safe way for me to teach them to cross this road. Yeah. And um, interestingly, and I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a, ju- a, a jump on this, that one of the most fascinating presentations that I've ever um I had the pleasure of um, being in the audience for was actually this. Um, he was a psychologist who was speaking about how you know risk is a really important part of um, a child's developmental learning, mm-hmm. and that we as children, um, those of us that would have walked to school or gotten the bus to school and then walked a section of it, or even just arrived early for training and had a little bit of time. To, we made decisions based on, you know, who are we going to play with or not? What direction are we going to go? Are we going to go and hang out with people hanging out outside the chipper on our way home or not? So that independent mobility was a really important part of our social learning mm. and, 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 and psych- sociological and psychological development and particularly around risk. That as a result of us now not having safe streets, parents are now driving their kids door to door and in a kind of a similar parallel way around kind of mainly driven from a child protection issue around sport we now have you know parents have to drop the children at the door there is like supervised everything is supervised from the minute they arrive they're told what groups to be in Mm. and they are collected all well-meaning decisions but some some from the travel perspective from they're, they're really coming from a safety traffic safety perspective so we have designed out that risk and all of those opportunities for and all yeah. those opportunities. And I went to speak with um, a group of transition year students in a school and I won't, I, like, I won't do any naming names. And this would be a pretty affluent school. And I wanted to just chat to them about the environment around where they were living and walking and other places you'll be safe. And I was just trying to draw out what are the things that inform their decisions. And it, it really took a very long time for anyone to say anything. And they started telling ghost stories. And I thought this was really bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, am I just not reading the room right? And then I asked them and it turned out none of them walk anywhere. Yeah. And as a result, they actually, they had no spatial geography. Yeah. They didn't know who lived near them. They didn't know, like if they had to walk somewhere, Mm -hmm. they had no idea how they were going to do that. And I think, I think that we have a real problem that, you know, and and this is something that, and a lot of the determinants of health, um, we see a socioeconomic, a lot of the um, deficiencies that we see 
in health often come from lower socioeconomic areas for various different reasons. But here is something that we're now going to see on the flip side of yeah. it. She's coming from, like, you know, higher socioeconomic areas. And I think it's something we need to be really mindful Absolutely. of. Absolutely. And it's just that everyone kind of channeled into kind of silos, people, you know, only associating with people of their own age or their own yeah. kind of, you know, people from their own school and just, you know, very narrow as opposed to, you know, incidental meetings on the street with older people or with people of different ages or with neighbours or, you know, yeah. it's it's uh, incredible to think of all that's lost with that. Yeah. yeah. And and in, you know, coming back to that piece about the like, you know, the engineering design and like, like you know, that has been a determinant of all of this that, you know, we have designed around the, the keeping people safe in cars. Yeah. Right? So our, our, our like when we've talked about traffic safety over the years, it's always been about um, the safety of the person in the vehicle has been paramount. And that is how most of our road safety strategies have been written. And um you know, I saw really another really interesting slide recently now, and you know, uh, you know this was a hypothesis rather than a study. I yeah, know to yeah. be very clear about that, but you know, it was formed on very sound logic, and it was basically linking the introduction of seatbelts to an increase in non-communicable diseases, so being like inflammatory diseases such as cancers and heart disease. I like, of course, when he said it first, everyone was like, "What do you want? What do you, what do you mean?" Yeah, but. What seatbelts did um, was that it gave drivers a greater sense of security and therefore drove more, um, you know, they, they weren't exhibiting as much care because they felt safer in their cars. Yeah. So they drove faster, probably took corners tighter. And that as a result has actually had less people walking on the streets. That decrease in physical activity has led to an increase in inflammatory disease. Mm. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah amazing yeah the kind of sense of invulnerability but mm-hmm. the cost of that then you know yeah and like for people that kind of car dominance again probably or clearly has a knock-on effect then in that people who don't have a car or maybe don't have access to a car are particularly penalized and that could be people with mobility issues yes or uh, you know sometimes uh for people with disabilities uh, who might be relying on carers and all of that you know that that the the it's just another blockage to traveling independently. No, absolutely. And it's an interesting narrative and one that we do need to research more. We need to be more informed in the discussion around this because we, there's there, there are two, absolutely two sides to this. There are people who do need their vehicle for their independent movement. Yeah. And there are those people that cannot drive, who, who are dependent on other people to drive them and they're therefore putting a caring burden on others. And, you know, when we think of like, this is amplified then when we actually widen our lens and not just talk to the individual users who generally we, we um, do our consultation with adults. Mm. We don't talk about the children yeah. or the elderly who, when we think about it, everyone, I keep talking about, like everyone has a universal design moment in their lives, right? So, and that came from Ludo Campbell Reed in, in the Auckland Design Champion. Like, and I just, I just loved it because, you know, we talk about people with disabilities as like almost like this minority group that we have to consider in our design. But the simple fact of the matter is it affects like, everybody. It affects everybody. Yeah. I know when I broke my leg, <laughs> you know, I relied on, you know, like I had those limitations to my mobility, which I then had to really think about how do I get around? Mm-hmm. And there was that burden of having to pay for taxis that I didn't have to before. And and even, you know, there's an increasing number of people telling us um you know, people with disabilities saying, well, look, actually, you know, especially arthritic conditions and um, arthritis Ireland are now prescribing physical activity as an anti-inflammatory. Like, so, you know, this is a counter of what we were always told before. You should like, you know, you should be resting and not moving. And we're actually going, well, actually, physical activity is 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 um, anti, an anti-inflammatory. And so people with knee and hip issues in particular are saying, well, actually cycling is um, so much easier for me than walking. Yeah. So so here's this increase in people who want to cycle, but yet there's a narrative saying, well, people with disabilities need their cars. And so yeah. we need to we need to be a broader ranging in the narratives that we that we bring to public consultation around projects. Absolutely. And I suppose it's a case of, you know, it's all the just in terms of kind of maybe reduction in car use and all of that. It's it's all the low hanging fruit, you know, yeah. that and that you the residual kind of need is there so there will there will always be people who rely on you know um maybe being dropped a bit closer or, mm-hmm. uh, but it's it's the the massive kind of unnecessary journeys that are kind of clogging that up yeah. um but also yeah it's interesting just different stages in your in people's lives as well uh you know that people might kind of find um 
that they're looking after an elderly parent and it's a, a huge eye opener then in terms of yeah. moving around and and that comes back to like the default and um for anyone who has read Invisible Women, I actually had to, like, um, Caroline Carez Perez, I can't remember her name now, but the, um, it's such an insightful book. And the the transport chapter, I actually had to listen to an audio book and go for a walk, an angry walk. I couldn't sit and read it. <laughs> it was so, But it was so insightful. And I can understand how the systems came to be the way they are, as she describes it, that it was really, like, that our... our our plans and our our infrastructure was basically designed and built around what she calls the default male. Mm. Because just by the very nature of it, it was the men who were sitting in traffic commuting every day to work at a time when there weren't as many women in the industry, in the transport industry. I remember when I decided I'd be an engineer, one of my grand aunts going, oh, she's like, give you a job in the office. Like she goes, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, yeah, it yeah. was it, like, that was just, a, that was just the, the social, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, and it was a social context at that point in time. So of course, when you arrive into work and you have to solve a problem, you're going to think about the problem that you encountered that day because like you, you're going to have this inherent bias. And at that point in time, we didn't do consultation. We didn't yeah. do user audits the way we do now. So we have these systems that are built around that commute. Mm. And again, the data we collected, we collected like it's a wonderful data set, the, the census, travel to work in school, but it only talks about the, the people who are there already. The yeah, yeah. It doesn't talk about that trip chaining. And your wonderful report here in TII, Travelling in a Woman's Shoes, highlighted that that the care burden um, and the transport elements of that care, like of, of caring, like it really does put a place a burden on people. Mm. And, you know, it's those short trips that we have designed out of our system. We've default designed for the longer trips. Um, so again, like it, it was great to highlight that, you know, not all trips are commute trips. Yeah, you know, exactly. The, the, uh, probably the proportion is nearly the other direction, you yes. know, but also, yeah, so you've, if, you, if you think about it, there's like barriers as in, you know, massive junctions that you talk about, maybe wide roads that are, uh, but there's also opportunities. I mean, beautiful yeah. opportunities for kind of social engagement and just, you know, quality of life issues that come yes. with improving walking. Yes, yes. Oh, I have I have two favorite stories to tell on this one. And um, and it, it, relating to where uh, like where we chose to live as a family. And it's quite funny because we live in the outer city in what we call a filtered permeability area. So there's bollards to stop traffic going through certain areas. We're very privileged to live there. It costs us a bloody fortune in rent. But, you know, doing what I do, this was the decision that we made. And um, it's just been really interesting. The two kind of stories, it's an older area. Um, there's an older population there. And I went to our local residence committee. Uh, it was actually around a Bus Connects project yeah. that uh, I went down to kind of hear what was going on. And I got outed at the meeting as being a transport expert. When <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a local representative was getting all these questions. And I was like, well, you should be asking her, not me. <laughs> and um, so when they were like turned to me to speak, I was like, well, actually, you know, um, you know, public transport is really great. An increase in public transport provision is really great because actually what's going to happen now is there's going to be more people passing your door. Yeah. So there's going to be more opportunities to, for socialization that, um, you know, people are going to be healthier in your neighborhood. The air is going to be cleaner. And I was, you know, kind of talked about it in that context. But then there was two stories that I brought to that group and one one to the group and one that came away from the group. And there was is this, there was an older lady in the neighborhood who used to come out to her gate twice a day, peak commute times, essentially. Yeah. So these were the only, she didn't have the mobility um, to go any further, but she'd come to her gate to meet people yeah. and say hello on their way to the bus yeah. and on their way home. And that was such an important part of her day. Yeah. Right. And then the others, so when I started telling the the um, the group and the, like this residence committee was so funny, they used to run a raffle to get all the older people to, to the meeting, which was, <laughs> I thought, was very, very ingenious. Yeah. They, they, um, I then spoke about how like high walkable areas, which this is, this area is, there's, there's an eight year delay in the onset of dementia. Mm. There is, you're much more likely to live to a hundred. So like for older people, there's a longevity piece to this. And um, so when I explained it, look, the bollards that you have here are a massive asset because they've, you know, of all these reasons. And this woman stood up and she goes, well, all I can say is God bless those bollards. I'm walking <laughs> home. Um, this guy, like we were, I was welcome with Sarah laughing and he was like, he goes, I was the chairman of the residence committee when those bollards were going in and she would definitely so wasn't them. supporting yeah, 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 them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think sometimes we need to go back with our, like, you know, the, we can have this really negative narrative around projects. Yeah. 
And it can be really difficult to describe. Um, you, you can bring all of these other studies and all these other case studies to a consultation and say, look, these are the benefits. And I get an all, I get a lot of, oh, sure, it's all fine and well for you, wherever. You know, people yeah, yeah. don't even, you know, they don't see the relevance and they, they're scared to change. And there's always, there's, that's always an important thing to recognize that people fear change. But I think it's really important for us to go back and collect the positive stories afterwards. Yeah, and, and see the really good examples out there and just, yeah, yeah absolutely. them back. Yeah, there's uh, just just your about the the lady. When you think of like older people, they literally can only go a couple of mm -hmm. meters sometimes, or you know, people with mobility issues, and just what the, the choices to stay indoors. You know, it's uh, yeah, uh, it's huge. We were chatting earlier just about like incidental play areas. So, yes. for example, for uh, people with kids walking, you know, it's it's not always a question of like um, big playgrounds and expensive infrastructure. Uh, and kind of having a really difficult walk to the playground. It's about just kind of a walking environment where there's a low wall or where, the, where there's, yeah. you know, incidental play areas and seating yeah. and resting areas along the route. And um, this is actually, I think it was, it was the same, um, it was the same conference. It may have been the same speaker that um, gave this example. He put up a photograph of this path and it had um, an old sty beside it as well, where they hadn't taken out the old step to sty on this, like this recreational walking path. Yeah. And he like he was there basically going, look, you know, this is what children want. Like they want the things to climb. And you were you was telling us a very telling me a very similar story earlier about a low wall. Like we can all relate to this as children, that the places we wanted to climb up and jump off and a progression in our I'm now big enough to do it. And yeah. I can do it myself independently. And that comes back to that risk piece, which mm. is really important. But um, he basically was saying, look, children want to climb over this die. And then he goes, and how many of you want, want to, to climb, climb over, over this die? <laughs> yeah, it's so, so true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so even as adults, yeah, we, yeah. we want to have that the variety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And like we do, like, and, and I think this is why, and um, actually playground design is another really interesting space. And actually we have a PhD student in TU Dublin looking at this because there there isn't really space design standards based on a scientific um you know studies as to what is good or are not good for in your playground um and but what is generally um acknowledged is that places where people have an, an um a freedom to decide how they use the equipment or how they use the space and, oppor and an opportunity to 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 be adventurous yeah um they are the the better play spaces and that is true of no matter what age you are. Yeah. So if a, a truly walkable area is one that you could go off and explore any different direction and feel safe. Yeah. And feel like, you know, it doesn't matter which way I go, it's permeable. So I'll come back on yeah, myself. Yeah. And, and I'll cut through this lovely uh, residential street or I'll walk down Camden Street or I'll do the back roads or, you know, yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. And people describe, and actually that's been a really interesting piece in walkability research when, um, when they've looked at the purpose of someone's walk, that, you know, when you're in a hurry and you're on your way to work, you don't actually really care so much about the, like the design of the street. You yeah. just want to get there quickly. And so, but not everyone is going to feel as safe in that space, but for the most part, people will like take that direct route. But people also want the opportunity to be under and like, you know, they called it the Sunday walk to get the paper. Yeah. They want an alternative route. So like when we describe our ideal walkable area, it is that there's a various different routes within the neighborhood to serve our different purposes because you know, this is also this perception that to walk, you need to have a park, whereas our streets can be parks. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they should be parks and we should have invitation to play in our residential streets. It really should be spaces where, you know, kids are out. And actually, that's another side, like thing with this per filter permeability we have. What you'll see around our neighborhood is goalposts and basketball rings at the side of the road. Yeah. Because the traffic is so low. It's only local people accessing that you actually see kids playing on the street, yeah. which is a forgotten art. It really is. I was just uh, chatting to someone the other day and they were talking about listening to Wimbledon on the radio while they were out just hitting a ball on the street. And it's like, you know, lovely memory. Yeah. You know, come June or whatever, this everyone out having a go. Yeah. On the and, street and, and, you know, uh, streets are a leveller. Yeah. You know, they're a social leveller. And, you know, it's really important that we all get to know our neighbours and then that's an opportunity for help uh, for helping others, socialisation. Mm -hmm. And look, this is so important for new moms, older people, people with, with reduced mobility. So to have to know your neighbours and who you can call upon if you need you need help. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, in contrast to if you're commuting to work in a car, you're like A to B as fast as you can or as, you know, efficiently as you can. And that's kind of your purpose. You know, it's like yeah. that's get from get my journey done uh, but they're sitting the, into a car to do go uh, to access what 
you know, we could potentially have on our streets. Yeah. Very good. And you uh, were the lead organizer for the Walk 21 conference. Yeah. Uh, do you want to chat about that? that uh, I was at it and it was absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, maybe chat through that and particularly uh, talk about the Youth Forum. Yes, yeah. So the Walk 21 conference. So Walk 21 are an international charity that um, an advocacy group um, th- like and there's so like, you know, they work with cities and countries all over the world to create walking policies and they're involved in like, you know, high level co- like UN road safety committees. And so th- they're brilliant advocates out and about, but they have this annual conference on walking and livable communities. It's been running for over 21 years, but it's been a bit of a passion project of mine to bring it to Ireland after, you know, attending it numerous times. And what I loved about the com- what I love about this conference in particular is that it's a mixed up, mixture of academics and advocates and people that are working in the implementation. So that there's this cross specialization and yeah. policymakers are there as well. And um, so yeah, so it was like it, it was it was brilliant. It's all a bit of a blurry now because it was such a busy time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the the youth forum that was something that we were particularly um, that we were particularly focused and and interested in doing because. You, we need to have everyone's voice. Yeah. You know, we, we we really do. And like our conference theme was a decade to change and, you know, kind of recognizing the urgency and what we need to change. And really, these are the people that we were, we are changing the, wor- the world for in our streets for. So it was really important to have their, their voice as part of it. And, you know, they thoroughly enjoyed it. And it was so informative. Mm. I just, well, every consultation ever, I'm all, I always learn something new. But just the perspectives and the outstanding one for me, um, well, there was two. The first one was actually, we had listed up like as an icebreaker. We were like, how many of these places can you walk? Because there's one of the tools we use for a measure walkability and it's like 13 different places going, can you, if you, ne- if you needed to, could you walk to one of these places from, or which of these could you walk to from your home? And it's kind of a general indicator. Yeah. And um, there was a few students kind of kicked up a little bit, kind of going, this isn't relevant to us, but I can walk to the canal. Like, you know, so they were rural dwellers. They were like, but we can walk to the GA pitch. We can walk to, and we're like, oh, sorry, we didn't have them on the list. You know, yeah, yeah. that we had a very urban perspective and it was great to get them to kind of keep us in check, kind of going, look, you know, rural areas can be walkable too, you yeah. know. Um, and the second one was actually the the dominance in the conversation from the female participants, especially the teenage female, um, it was like, educate your sons. And it was down to harassment and it was just this real clear, you know, tell guys it's not OK for them to be wolf whistling at us or to be saying these things that are really, um, they, 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 they probably are, don't mean it in that, like they don't realise how it's having a, a yeah. negative effect on us and how anxious it's making us and how we won't want, don't want to walk because we can hear this. Yeah. And it was so, it was so, so strong. Yeah. It was, and I was like, OK, well, look here, this is something we need to be going out and shouting from the rooftops because it is that um education piece yeah. you know to go back and kind of say guys you probably don't realize you know yeah yeah but this is really impacting on people's decisions yeah amazing yeah and there was a really big focus on uh, accessibility for people with mobility issues people who were blind at that conference as well mm-hmm. um yeah no it was it like we were we, we were very aware and um and it, it was a key focus because like there was venues that we just had to not like that we would have liked to have used that we just had to totally discount because if they weren't accessible we weren't using them yeah and um and even in our social venues we made sure that everybody could participate in, at, at any yeah at, at any event and you got good feedback from from people of kind of diverse ability yeah at that was that one of the things that comes up at our user group meetings is I suppose for people who are blind or maybe a bit unsteady on their feet that just the absolute fear of the e-scooters and all of that yeah. and the um and I suppose it's how to how to kind of capitalize on the benefits of all of that kind of um, more sustainable mobility it's better than driving obviously yeah but how to also really take seriously the kind of how that's a barrier to people walking they're afraid they're kind of even the whir of the yeah. electric engine or whatever can put people off balance or just make them afraid to go out yeah and I think this is where the benefit of consultation where we where we capture um you know people's like views and opinions and experiences yeah and being able to feed them into consultation and it like it, I think the e-mobility um, conversation has really um just I suppose started 
uh, like if I feel like it has been the conduit by which we've had much greater conversations around public space. Yeah, that we actually held, um, uh, we we hosted it for in by, on behalf of the Transport Planning Society, a kind of a panel event up in TU Dublin, um, and we had like where the topic was e mobility, but really, <clears throat> excuse me, the conversation was around the sharing of road space. Yeah, so so what we have now is this new a new technology, a new vehicle, a new mode. And it's trying to find where do they fit? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. and because there are challenges and barriers, <clears throat> but we also have to recognize that they, as an entry level, they like they're cheap. Yeah. You know, particularly. So we're seeing it with our student cohorts. So we've no, le- because there's no legislation around them right now, we can't be seen to promote them. But however, we're seeing loads of students coming in with them and storage is an issue and whatever. But with any, any vehicle, like whether it is a bicycle, whether it is a um, scooter, what it all comes down to is fundamentally respect for road users. Yeah, yeah. Like no matter what you're like. And, you know, that dominance. And like, I know I'm opening a whole other can of worms here, but it's just the dominant narratives. And I have a PhD student who's been doing the most wonderful work. She's nearly finished. And once this information gets out there, I, I'm, I'm so excited for it. That she is basically basically applying social dominance theory. Like, no, it, 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 that was what, where she came to. Yeah. In relation to narratives around, first of all, car advertising and even the conversations she analyzed. She's from a media background when she analyzed, you know, um, narratives on TV programs and the dichotomy that's been put out there against cyclists versus cars and, yeah. you know, e-scooters versus and trying to polarize the conversation. It doesn't need to be polarized. Yeah. What's needed is for everyone to have respect for each other on the road. Yeah. But the more the people try to polarize it, and I get it. I have friends who are journalists. They're under ferocious pe- pressure to get those clicks. And, yeah, you know, yeah, the goodies and baddies. There's goodies and baddies. And that's part of what they have to work with within, you know, their uh, profession right now. Um, so, like, it is a really complex whole systems problem. Yeah. But um, I think, look, e-scooters, they... They have a lot of benefits in many ways from a mobility perspective. For so people with limited mobility, it does allow them to go further distances. Mm. There are challenges because of the, you know, the small wheels, a small pothole can have a massive impact on somebody yeah. versus a cycling wheel. Like, you know, so there, there are a whole oh, factor yeah. of things to be considered. And and so interesting the way you put it there, just, you know, in the past we would have looked at a plaza or space and it would have been a kind of an almost a stylistic assessment or you know urban design assessment whereas now it's a social yeah. assessment it's about how people navigate how people work with each other yeah. and uh trying to find yeah. trying to find solutions um and, and and again a lot of your work is is to do with behavioral attitudes and um yeah yeah and i think like you know interestingly you know um I kind of make, coming back to kind of the COVID response in Ireland, I think one of the most fascinating parts of it was actually the the approach that the Irish government took in relation to addressing the behavioural like yeah. elements of it. So when they started to introduce the lockdowns, they put a really strong emphasis on that communi- sense of community, helping each other, you know, the purpose mm. behind it. You know, I know things changed as time went on, but that really strong, you know, that communication around we are collectively doing this for everybody we understand that you're going to face challenges and and, and yourselves and there are going to be limitations and you'll be frustrated by those limitations but please think about the you know the other um impacts of that and i think there's a lot of learning that we we could use that in lots of different ways and actually the first module that people take on our sustainable transport mobility um course is behavior change yeah it's understanding like how people think and how we can communicate and and again moving away from a kind of a polarization of people like pitting one against the other but like coming together in good faith yeah try to find out um uh, you know solutions and, and possibilities and opportunities no that's absolutely it and I suppose kind of looping that back to Walk 21 that we had an amazing steering committee and uh, advisory committee where we brought together all the different agencies we had representation from like the um, National Disability Authority and then we had presentations from different minority groups and uh, uh, as well um, I was really proud that Pavi Point came in pre- and presented and like and you know they were so proud that they got this like this opportunity but like you know they are absolutely 
be part of the conversation. Yeah, why, yeah, why shouldn't yeah. they be? And the NCBI ran a really inclusive workshop around, you know, cane use and to have people blindfolded with canes out walking around the place. And I, I just really felt that like yeah, that normalization of the conversation. More about both actually the Pavi Point presentation and the NCBI one. I'd be really interested to hear about those. So um, Pavi Point did um, did a piece about basically did a walkability audit around one of the halting sites. Yeah. You know, and uh, for me, it was, you know, the walk, like, we, you know, any, any group can go out and do a walkability audit and feedback. And that's really important. But I think it was empowering them yeah. to feel like their voices were equal because mm-hmm. they are yeah. like, you know, to have their voices equally recognized in the challenges that they faced. Yeah. You know, and bringing that into the public. Exactly. Um, that it's a unique com- community, but part of the community. And on the NCBI, uh, the, 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 the walk uh, that was done, how yeah. did that go? That was, you know, we got we got amazing feedback from that one. And um, it actually, we, it got picked up by the national press as well, which is always a good thing. It's yeah. always good to promote these things. So um, Chantal Smith up there, she came down. And like, I say up there, up there. They're very close to us in TU Dublin. So like it's only up the road. So they came down and they um, basically blindfolded people Mm -hmm. and, you know, people worked in Paris. So like the person that was blindfolded also had a cane Mm -hmm. and basically just like they simply walked around the neighborhood. Yeah. And like, so these people that were partaking in it were, they were practitioners, they were designers, they were lecturers. So, and so people from the community. So it was really brilliant for them to get to experience what it is like to be a cane user. And some of the examples were, you know, where people were saying where they had to walk out between cars and how vulnerable they felt. Like, yeah. You know, that, you know, here was a part like the, the the placement of parking was having a massive detrimental effect on this, uh, on the that experience. That visibility or just sense of safety. Yeah. Yeah. And even pavement, and like, and, and, and the oxymoron that I, I'm always fascinated by as well as something I've learned through my involvement with the Irish Pedestrian Network is the, um, the tactile paving yeah. that we've put in to kind of t- for people with sight uh, impairments to help them cross the road that actually cane users are now getting repetitive strain injuries in their wrist because when they're running their cane over those bumps, it's causing a, a, a vibration, vibration. Yeah, in their yeah. wrists. And again, these are things that like a well-meaning designer yeah. who came up with the tactile paving and that idea, like, you know, you know, and, and we've rolled them out everywhere. That was something we weren't aware of and now we need to consider yeah. going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And just, I saw uh, just from uh, reading about you <laughs> uh, that you had done a, a lot of work on apps and, and ways yeah. of kind of mapping um, mapping your walking route and all of that. How how are they working and, and do you, you must, it must be must be a really good way of collecting feedback just on local yeah. neighborhood areas and, and a useful tool for people. Yeah, so the, the tool is called the Walkability app. And we've actually, we developed it with like our key stake or the, the key people are working on it are based out in Chile and it's with Walk21. But we also had, um, we also developed like a network of, like it was 30, people from 32 countries yeah. who are all doing different type of app based auditing tools. But the, essentially the idea behind this is this, this open source tool where anyone can use it. But that on the back end, when I talk about the back end, that's the interface at which we can then basically produce maps for local authorities to say, look, these are the places, you know, based on like, and it's a traffic light system. And actually the the original project that this came from um, was actually, it was originally run in Medine in Colombia, where they went out with um, lollipops, kind of large lollipops with the, with the red, orange and green and asking the children to say, do you think this is good, bad? And and that was mapped. So it was actually, it came from like a physical project into this app and to produce the mapping. But we've added another layer of where people, but, you know, you can just do the traffic light on the app, but you can also go in a step further and say, is it because of safety from traffic and, the, you know, yeah. a bit more detail. So that is, you know, that's that's an, one of those ongoing projects that hopefully will have up and running very, yeah. very soon. And that sounds fantastic that it's not just, it's not just kind of, this is terrible, but there's parts of your walk that are beautiful, that yeah. are working well. That's really, really great. Yeah, because like, again, to, to inform design, because, and look, you know, um, we're like, you know, this in some sectors we think, okay, we need to take out the trees for. There's various different reasons why you, for trips and falls, if the broken pavement, and you know, sometimes we're like, okay, well, the solution is to cut out the tree. Whereas if we collect the data and you know we see, okay, well, actually, trees are really important. Now we, there's like you know, getting technical about it, there are so many other benefits way beyond everything, as especially as our climate heats up, there's heat island effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, and the greenery, and actually the the massive mental health benefits of being exposed to to green and trees. So we have to kind of make informed decisions about what do we do. It's no longer a case of people are tripping over the, the root of that tree. 
we need to address this. Yeah. And instead of just taking it out, we actually have to balance that with all of the, everything else. So when we collect this data and people are saying, well, actually a positive of this street is the beautiful trees in it. Yeah. That helps us inform exactly, that conversation. That, 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 that it's not just a, oh, it's a trip hazard, take it out. You know, yeah. you're kind of thinking of it in the round and, you know, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Just to summarise, how would you say for, for young people and particularly young people with mobility issues and trying to access public transport to access all of the social aspects of their lives, you know, what, how would you yeah. sum up what designers and decision makers need to start doing? I know we've covered a lot. Already. Yeah, no, I think I think I think it fundamentally comes back to that functional environment. And because our footpaths, because every trip, you know, regardless of what the trip is, involves a walking trip. And when I talk about walking, I talk about run, push, roll, you know, the, like the, you know, the full suite of movement in space. We just, you know, we just use walking for convenience as a term. But the, um, you know, having a continuous route or path that is free of obstacles, yeah. you know, to any space. So, so that permeability piece. And look, that means, you know, enforcement around people parking on pavements and yeah. broken pavements are coming from vehicles parking on them. It's not because the pavements break from break people walking on, on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so and but and good public tra- public transport doesn't work without good walkability. Yeah. Because everybody needs to feel safe and, se- and secure approaching that stop and safe and secure space. But then obviously the getting on and off of public transport Um so, and being able to, like, I suppose, core to walkability, like we say, a walkable place is somewhere you can access all your needs within a 10 minute walk from your home, yeah. essentially. So, you know, you know, like, yeah, the 15 minute city kind of badge is gaining traction these days, but it's fundamentally that it's the traditional villages that we've always lived in, whether they be in an urban or a rural context, so that anybody can access whatever they need. Yeah. So what we need to, like, basically retrospectively look at all our places and spaces do we have that good permeability and the answer in quite a lot of particularly suburban areas are places that have been built since the 1960s but particularly since the 1990s mm. we have these long cul-de-sac estates they are not permeable you like it's take the, the school could be over the wall yeah but it might you might have to go two kilometers to get to that school but you know if you can't drive or if you can only walk a certain distance yeah you know, suddenly you're excluded from being able to go and socialize after school or walk independently with your friends, and which, we, as I mentioned earlier, has social and psychological effects in the long term. So good permeability, a good functional space, places to congregate, actually. Yeah, places to congregate is a really interesting one mm. that um, they need to be overlooked. So teenagers want to hang out. Yeah. Right. But people feel threatened by groups of teacher, teenagers hanging out, yeah, <laughs> you know, okay. and they call it antisocial behavior, which I, I like. I really am not comfortable with the term because it's some of the most social behavior that you can see, and it's a really important. Absolutely, thing. and and you often get that like with oh, we can't put a tree or a bench in there because it'll encourage antisocial behavior. Like, what could be more social than a tree and a bench and people gathering on exactly. it? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I know people might be getting involved in so. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, and so. Often what we find is the places that you'll see graffiti and the broken glass where there's evidently been some drinking or whatever happening, you know, they're places that are not overlooked. Mm. So when there are what we call eyes in the street or when there's a, like a good flow of people through an area, that's when you you won't see as much of that, you know, um, whether it be criminal or, you know, more destructive behaviour, let's yeah. just say, socially destructive behaviour. But it's important that we do provide places for people to congregate and to sit. Older people need places to sit on their walks. Yeah. And there was a wonderful walk, walkability audit study that was done by, um, I think it was Agent Opportunity. And I, I'm sorry if I've gotten that wrong. I'm pretty sure that was the group that did it. And they took planning students. It was during the recession when planning students didn't have, there was no work available for them. And they basically brought them on on inter- internships and worked with different disability and, ac- and older age groups. Um, in different towns and they wrote, wrote up permeability reports and submitted them to local authorities. It was a wonderful project. But I remember hearing feedback on one and it was um, it was a town in Kildare where one of the ladies that was on the walk, she just turned and she looked at this low window that had one of those railings, you know, the, oh, like yeah, the spiky, spiky railing. railings. Yeah. And she goes, well, they obviously don't want me to sit and rest. <laughs> you know? For her, she was looking, she needed to stop every few few hundred litres even like you know and the, she was looking for any opportunity yeah. to sit right and I used to love again we had a low wall outside the last house I lived in and I loved it when people came and they sat on the wall and you could see these little conversations popping up and but if I ever I kind of waved out people were like oh, oh, oh I'll go and I'm like no 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 this is lovely <laughs> they thought delighted. you were shaking the fist <laughs> yeah. and, and again people just like 
I suppose I, like it's a really complex. It's really complex, but this feeling people, some people like you know, this defensible space. Yeah, and um, they they don't want people encroaching on their space. And generally, we find that more so in areas where there's low social cohesion. So essentially, where people don't know their neighbours. Mm. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and particularly in suburban areas. And there's lots of people who do select to live in suburban areas because of that uniformity and that, you know, I have my front garden and I can get into my car and I can drive where I need to go. And maybe they like, you know, they fear that social, the socialization of it. Yeah. Um, but that does have um, health impacts. Mm. Like it really does. Lorraine, thank you so much for talking to us. That was absolutely enlightening and interesting and and it was great to hear your unique take on all of these things. So You're thank welcome. you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So that's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed hearing from Angie and her experience with student life and Lorraine and her work of placemaking and inclusive design. Further information on Lorraine's work can be found on our website. Thank you to our host, Sarah O'Donnell, to Trevor Cudden on sound, to our production team, Kathleen Jacobi, Rachel Cahill and Claire Scott, to Sinead Foley from TU Dublin, who designed our fantastic graphics, and to everyone else who helped make this podcast. Please send us your comments and feedback to allaboard at tii.ie. For more episodes from All Aboard, please go to Spotify, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time.